Let's jump right into it. I'm ready. Um, Jonathan, the most famous man of the 20th century, uh, Muhammad Ali. What don't we know about him? <laughs> why, why would you write a book, and a hefty book at that, um, on, on such a figure that we know so much about? Well, you know, I agree with you. He's probably the most famous man of the 20th century. And there have been a lot of books written about him. But sometimes you need to step back a little bit um, and have some perspective, have a little bit of distance from what was going on. And it occurred to me about four or five years ago that, and I've read almost everything there was to read about Ali, that all the books were really pretty narrowly focused. There's books by Norman Mailer about the rumble in the jungle or the first Fraser fight. There's a book by George Plimpton that covers the year right after Zaire. There's a terrific book by David Remnick that covers really the first three years of Ali's career. But nobody had stopped and done the big biography. And if this guy really is the most important, or one of the most interesting men of the 20th century, the most famous man of the 20th century, at some point he deserves the big fat biography treatment. And this seemed like the perfect time to do it because 50 years had gone by since he joined the Nation of Islam, beat Sonny Liston, became the heavyweight champ, announced that he's not going to fight in Vietnam, the most important years of his, of his life, arguably. And you can look back at FBI records now, you can look back at those fights, you can look back at the Vietnam War and put these things in greater perspective. And I um, also found that it's a, kind of a sweet spot because there are still hundreds of people alive who knew Ali really well. Mm -hmm. And I did something like 500, 600 interviews for this book, um, including you know, all three of his surviving wives, um, his brother, um, all, all the men who he fought who were still alive, and um, his business managers, his promoters, there, you know, many of them. And they hadn't really, also when enough time goes by, they'll speak more honestly mm -hmm. than they would have when you were interviewing them in the 70s or 80s when Ali was still active and they had a business interest to protect. So it just seemed like the perfect time to, to look back at this guy's life. And also, I mean, it's not just a, a famous man, it's a man whose life touches on some of the most important issues that we're still fighting over, race, religion, war, um, politics. He's at the center of it. And I think we needed to put that story in some perspective today and look at what he means to us today. So I felt like when I, when I realized nobody had done the full-blown biography yet, I felt like, you know, ooh, there's a suitcase full of money on the sidewalk over there, and nobody has picked it up yet. Uh, and I wasn't doing it for the money, I don't mean it that way, I just meant like, because I'm a writer, I'm not, believe me, I'm not doing this for the money, I'm pretty stupid, and I'm not that stupid. Um, but I was just so excited about the, the possibility. Well, it's a, great, it's a great book, let me say. Uh, those of you who uh, have yet to read it, you are in store for a treat. Um, being that he was so controversial, uh, how accessible were, were these, these people, the people you interviewed, who, who, were, who had access to him? Oh, man. I could go on and on telling some of these stories. Let me show you a picture. This is the first time that I met um, Ali's wife, Khalila. It was here in Chicago. She was attending a premiere of a film that you are interviewed in, oh, okay. um, the Bill Siegel documentary. And I went up to her and said, I'm writing your biography of your husband. And this is, she's the first person I had approached. So to say that I'm writing Muhammad Ali's biography is a little bit um, premature, perhaps, um, to put it mildly. <laughs> um, and she said, OK, so who are you? And what, who gave you permission to write Ali's biography? And I said, nobody. And by the way, she calls her husband Ali, her former husband. This is mm -hmm. Ali's second wife. They were married when, when uh, she was named Belinda, and she was 17 years old. And I said, well, nobody really gave me permission, but I was kind of hoping you'd talk to me anyway. And with every single person, it was a dance. It was a battle to get them to talk. Why should they trust me? But I had four years to work on this, and I had lots of time to persuade her and others. And some of them were really difficult. Don King, I had to chase around the country three or four times. But Belinda, Kalila, um, was coming to Chicago pretty often, and she was working um, with a business that provided dental insurance for seniors. And I would just show up at the senior centers where she was pitching her dental plans. <laughs> And uh, I would take her out to lunch when we got done. And then I met a photographer on the south side, um, Lowell Riley, who took pictures of, for the Nation of Islam. And he had all these old, beautiful pictures of Khalila from when she was a teenager. And I would bring them around to her and show her the pictures. And I just eventually like, wormed my way in to her good graces and ended up interviewing her for dozens of hours. So a lot of these figures were not instantly approachable, mm -hmm. but 
you know, you get to know Kalila, and then and she tells her kids it's okay to talk to me, and she tells some of Ali's ma business managers, some of Ali's other friends that I'm all right, and, mm -hmm. it, you know, you just work it um, like you as a journalist would work, you know, a, a, a series of sources until they begin to trust you, and until, you know, I went from doing one interview with her, pretending I was Muhammad Ali's biographer, to mm -hmm. legitimately becoming an expert, and uh, just takes time and, and, and persistence. Well, you know, you, you also got to manage to get a lot of uh, information about his early years. Uh, that, that, those, those years are really unchronicled in, in all of the books that, that you ref referenced. How did you, how did you get those, those uh, sources? I mean, these are people who go way back with him. Yeah, you know, I found some of Ali's ancestors, some of his aunts and uncles and cousins who had never really been approached before. And one of the, just for example, one of them mentioned, you know, Ali's grandfather was in jail for something. I don't remember what it was, but he was, had a criminal background. And Ali's uncle also did time. So, you know, we live in the digital age. It's a lot easier to search these things. And his, fortunately, you know, um, his, his grandfather uh, had a relatively unusual name, Herman Heaton Clay. So I went and checked criminal records in, in Louisville and found that he was a convicted murderer. And Ali didn't even know that. Wow. Um, he married after he got out of prison. So the family knew that he had some criminal background, but they didn't know he was a convicted murderer. So think about that. You have a man who's the, the great grandson of slaves, the grandson of a convicted murderer, the son of a drunk who's abusive, um, who, who beat his children and his wife, and he goes on to become... This is something else we didn't know about either. No, we really didn't. Uh, um, it had been rumored. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for someone like that, to overcome those things, not to mention overcoming the fact that he's grown up black in Jim Crow Louisville. I mean, that's a, not some small thing to overcome, right. but to overcome his own background, his own family background, and to become you know, a man who's admired around the world, and not a perfect man, but, a, but certainly a hero in many respects, is, just makes the story unbelievably dramatic. And that's why I think you can make a claim this is one of the great life stories of, of all American history. Yeah, certainly. Um a kind of a rebooted Horatio Alger kind of thing, right? Yeah, I guess so. Um, it's a little different for, uh, <laughs> as, you, as you know, for um, someone who's coming out of a family that was you know, t two generations removed from slavery. It's not exactly the Horatio Alger stuff that, uh, but it's, uh, it's its own, it's, in some ways it's a better story. He didn't, he didn't uh, exhibit any extraordinary athletic uh, abilities in, in his youth, did he? No, that's one of the funny things about it. I was really struck by this. His, his, I interviewed a bun bunch of his friends from the neighborhood, and I said, was he just like an awesome athlete? You know, you play foot, pick up football on the streets, you play baseball, basketball. No, he's terrible, they said. <laughs> he couldn't shoot a basketball to save his life. <laughs> and he hated the idea of even playing. He might have been good at football because he's big, but he hated the idea of having to wear a helmet because people wouldn't see how pretty he was. <laughs> and what's the point of being on the field with, with 10 other guys? I'm the only one that people want to see. You know, from, from, the, from an very early age, he was very fond of himself. And, and I will say I learned that um, he was severely dyslexic, and I think that had something to do with it, his quest for attention. He, he needed to make people love him all the time. And he wasn't able to do that in the classroom, even though he was very bright. Mm -hmm. um, so he found other ways. He became the class clown. Um, one of my favorite stories about Ali, how many people know the story um, about him racing the bus to school when he was just becoming a boxer? So a few people know that one. It's one of these legends that you always have to check them out because they turn out to be baloney most of the time. The, the story of Ali having his bicycle stolen and, and learning how to box, that one turned out to be true. But the story that he used to race the bus to school, one thing I learned from Robert Caro, the great LBJ biogra biographer, is that you always ask your subjects when you're interviewing them, put me in the room. What, did, what was it like to be in the room? So I wanted to know what was it like to be on the bus when Ali was racing mm -hmm. the bus. Mm -hmm. Was it a school bus? Like I would ask these kids, they're now in their 70s, but I would ask these kids who were, went to school with Ali, you know, did you yell out the window to him when he was racing? Like, did he wear his school clothes or did he wear gym clothes? Was he wearing sneakers or shoes? Um, you know, I wanted to know this stuff. And one of Ali's friends, a guy named Owen Sitgrave, said, oh, you know, it was a city bus. It was a 10 cents to ride. And a couple months later, I was thinking about that and something just didn't sit right. And I called Mr. Sitgraves back and I said, it was a city bus? And he said, yeah. I said, doesn't that stop every block? <laughs> and he said, yeah, pretty much. And we transferred at Chestnut. So I said, was he really racing the bus to school? 
Uh, he said, no, he wasn't racing the bus. He'd stop with us every time the bus stopped. <laughs> and when we got off at Chestnut, he'd wait with us for the next bus. And sometimes he'd grab onto the window and swing on the side of the bus for a block or two. So he wasn't doing it for the exercise at all. He was doing it for the attention. And that's when I began to understand this guy, that all his life he had these, I think he had these warring um, things going on in his brain. He wanted to be different. He wanted to rebel. He wanted to be different from his father, who was drunk. He wanted to be different because he grew up in a society that said black people couldn't do certain things, and he didn't understand why. But he also wanted to be loved, and it was very hard sometimes to make those two things fit. And that's, I think that's one of the recurring themes in this book, is how do you be a rebel and be loved? And Ali was trying to figure that out. Mm, mm, it is a hard mix. Um, you, you said he, had, he suffered from dyslexia, but you also pointed out some very interesting stuff, that, that people who do suffer from dyslexia have other compensatory talents that, that, that are also um, uh, extraordinary. Like he, he, he could perceive patterns in ways that other, others couldn't, and that people who suffer from, from dyslexia often exhibit that capacity. Yeah, very often dyslexics are, have great visual skills or great other motor functions. And one of the reasons is that if you do not learn to read, this is also true for illiterate societies, if you do not learn to read, your brain is wired differently. Reading rewires your brain so that you can listen to me and you can really focus on what I'm saying, but if the person next to you is having a conversation, you can't understand it because the act of reading has rewired your brain to concentrate on one thing at a time when it requires attention. But if you are dyslexic or illiterate, you can hear two conversations at once, or you can pick up visual signs, visual patterns that you might not otherwise pick up. So for Ali as a boxer, he might have been able to pick up more clues about where the punches were coming from or where a fighter was getting ready to move before other people. Um, it's one theory about why he might have been so fast, why his reflexes were so great. And if you know anything about Ali and uh, about boxing, people thought he had no chance to be a successful boxer because he never learned proper technique. The proper technique for a boxer is to keep your hands up, protect your head, and duck punches. He never did it. He was so fast he didn't have to. He just moved his head out of the way. And, and, and it was, he said, he claimed that, that he was so quick that even when he was hit, he was able to move just enough at the last second that the punch really wouldn't hit him as hard as it, mm. as it should have because and he believed that and it was all instinctive and he believed that that was one of the reasons for his success and early in his career it was. As he gets older and slower, his poor boxing technique would come back to hurt him mm. in a big way, mm. which we can talk about um, yes, we will as we get that. toward that. Um, he, you, you mentioned vanity also, his sense of vanity. Do you, there are some who say that it was that, it was that quest for recognition that really is the reason that he became a boxer, that he became a, um, this amateur, this, this very um, accomplished amateur boxer. It was just vanity that drove him. I think that's right. You know, one of the great stories about Ali that also turns out to be true is that when he was 12 years old and fighting in amateur fights, they, they were, they'd put him on TV on Friday nights in Louisville and the fighters would get paid five bucks if they were on TV. And he used to go knocking on doors in white neighborhoods saying, hey, be sure to watch me on TV tonight. I'm gonna be boxing. And one day he knocked on a door and, and his, his trainer opened it up. And he said, what, the, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I'm going around the neighborhood telling people to watch me on TV tonight. Well, why? You get paid the same five bucks no matter how many people. He wanted to be famous. And you know, it's, uh, you know, James Baldwin said that to be, to be black in the, in the age of uh, Jim Crow, um, the age, maybe today as well, you need to have a lever to be heard, to, to wield any power. And Ali saw boxing as that, as that lever. He saw that as a way for him to be different and to stand out and to speak up to power um, eventually, not at age 12 necessarily. Uh, but then it was probably just pure vanity um, because he, like I said, he always thought highly of himself. But he, 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 when he was young, he came in contact with the Nation of Islam. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and it planted a seed kind of in his, in his consciousness, I guess you, you can say, because the, it, 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 it sprouted later. But um, he didn't exhibit any kind of uh, uh, political, in, any kind of uh, aptitude for political activism or anything like that, did he? No, none whatsoever. It's really interesting. I mean, his father talked a lot about race and, and was a Garveyite, believed that the only way black people were ever going to be treated... His father was a Garveyite. Yeah. Okay. Only way black people were ever going to be treated equal was to, was to get out of the United States. And Ali was also the same age as Emmett Till, so he, that made a big impression on him, as it did most people um, at that time. And 
he, but he, he avoided it. There were protests. You know, his schools, um, Louisville Public Schools desegregated while Ali was in school. And there were all kinds of protests about it. And in fact, um, they, they desegregated, but, but they would not allow black teachers to work in white schools. There were all these restrictions and there were a lot of protests about it, but Ali wouldn't go to any of the protests. He wasn't interested in it. It wasn't until he discovered the Nation of Islam that, that something um, clicked. Mm -hmm. And he was probably about 15 or 16 when, when he heard about the Nation of Islam. His first contact was um, a guy selling the newspapers, Muhammad Speaks, mm -hmm. and then um, he heard uh, Louis Farrakhan's record, it was, then he was called Louis X, mm -hmm. his record, um, a, a song called The White Man's Heaven is the Black right. Man's Hell. And he began to play that over and over and memorize it, and it became kind of his, um, a big part of his, his, his philosophy. He began to believe, and it tied back to what his father used to say, that black separatism was the only solution, mm. that integration was never going to work. And he was in high school at this time. In high school, he and actually. He, was also, he also had a very uh, active boxing career going as well, right? That's right. He was traveling all the time as an amateur fighter, winning Golden Gloves tournaments, and not paying much attention to school. But he did at one point ask one of his teachers if he could write a paper about the Nation of Islam, which for Ali must have been a shock. Like, this was a kid who did not do any of his schoolwork. And unfortunately, the teacher said, no, that's too controversial. You can't write about it. It's uh, unfortunate. I would have liked to have read that paper. So when, when did he, um, well, he, he, he became successful as an amateur boxer, eventually winning the Olympics. It was a big thing for him to win the Olympics. So another good how picture. did that affect his, his, uh, his um, overall... Uh, sense of himself. Uh, this is the home where Ali grew up, by the way. Mm. This is the uh, gym where he used to box. And that's uh, Ali returning from the 1960 Olympics. Um, this is a kid who'd never traveled anywhere. He was scared to death of airplanes. Um, he once bought a parachute to take with him on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he won the tournament out in San Francisco, he sold the watch that they gave him for winning the tournament and used it to buy a train ticket back home because he didn't want to fly. Um, but he makes it to Rome for the Olympics, and he's not really seen as a likely candidate to win the gold, and he's not really seen as a likely candidate to become a, a great boxing champion, again, because he has this poor technique, and he's a little bit undersized for a heavyweight. But regardless, he becomes the mayor of the Olympic Village. Everybody wants their picture taken with this guy. The reporters all flock to him. Jesse Owens says, I don't know if, if, any, if this kid can box or not, because I'm not, I'm not an expert on boxing, but... He's got star quality, and the charm, even at age 18, is off the charts. He, he's magnetic. He has this charisma that just lights people up, and um, you can see it in the picture. Um, it's not just that he's returning to his high school. I mean, look at the faces around him. These, these, everybody loved him. I talked to his high school girlfriend, and she said, it was just impossible to be in a bad mood around the guy. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was true all his life. People just fell in love with him. Um, and, and that was a big part of his charm. And again, it goes back to this wanting to be loved and at the same time wanting to be a rebel. And, he's, and when he joins the Nation of Islam, he becomes arguably the most despised man in America, certainly in white America. And yet he does it with this twinkle in his eye and he's still like, you know, goofing around with these white reporters, even while he's saying that all white people are the devils. You know, it's, he, he somehow pulls it off. Mm. Uh. <laughs> you tell me. You tell it's me how he did that. It's a magic trick indeed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, uh, the, the many things about your book. First of all, I, 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 uh, I tried to skim it, you know, because it's a large book. I only had a week or so to, to get through it, and I couldn't skim it, man. It was so interesting. Thanks. I had to get deeply into the story because you, you, the way you write, it draws, it draws the, uh, the reader in. In, in a very compelling way. Thank you. Um, and you also spent a lot of time uh, describing blow by blow, uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, uh, intricacies of, of his of his boxing matches, and that that was kind of surprising for for a literary journalist like yourself. Well, you know, one of the reasons I love writing about sports is because there's action. It'd be very hard to write about a poet. And then he sat down at his desk <laughs> and took out a number two pencil and began to draw a line that connected to another line, right? Boxing is great. I mean, I wanted as much of it in the book as I could without bogging it down too much. Um, you know, when, when, these are just great action scenes. When he fights this guy, Sonny Liston, mm. and wins the heavyweight championship, people just assume that Ali is going to be killed. Every reporter there says that this guy has no chance, that Sonny Liston knocks out his opponents 
his last three opponents had lasted a total of like two minutes with, with Liston. And, and here comes Cassius Clay, who doesn't really even know how to box. And the only question is whether he's going to be knocked out in the first round or killed in the first round. <laughs> and, and he, as soon as he gets in the ring, you realize Ali's a better boxer. He's younger, he's faster, he's probably just as strong. And you see Liston starting to fade, starting to get tired. So in addition to understanding the sport and, and boxing itself, I wanted to also understand Ali and the damage he was doing to himself. Because again, you know, we talked about in the very beginning why this is the time to write the big biography. Well, we understand now CTE and, and what, mm -hmm. this da what boxing can do to a brain. So one of the things I did for this book is I worked with a boxing stats company to count every punch that hit Ali and every punch that Ali hit his opponents with. And you can see when he's fighting Sonny Liston that he's out hitting his opponents, Liston and others, during this era in the 1960s when he's fast. He's out hitting them by a huge uh, rate. And then in the second half of his career, it starts to even out. And by the, by the third part of his career, by the end of his career, he's getting out punched dramatically. He's taking a huge number of punches. And I calculated that he was probably hit about 200,000 times. If you count his amateur fights, his professional fights, his sparring sessions, his exhibitions, 200,000 blows from some of the biggest, strongest men on earth. And in the end stages of his career, he was actually doing it on purpose. He was letting his opponents hit him so they would get tired, the rope-a-dope. Um, and, and he'd wait to fight back until they get tired. And he would have his sparring partners, he would hire the strongest men he could and say, just hit me in the head because he thought he could build up resistance to it, like you'd build up calluses. Mm. And I also worked with um, speech scientists at Arizona State University. We tracked Ali's speaking rate, year by year, fight by fight. Mm -hmm. And a normal person between the age of 30 and 40 would not lose any of their speaking rate. You and I are speaking at about the same rate, syllables per second, that we did when we were 20 years old. No, we're, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, because we haven't been hit in the head too much, among other things. Um, the writing life is, may not be good for, for exciting scenes in a book, but it's good for your brain. And um, no Ali, Ali lost 26% of his speaking rate between the age of 30 and 40. And after certain fights, when it, he takes a particularly large amount of punishment, you can see his speaking rate just nosedive. Then it starts to come back in between fights, and then it would mm. not nosedive again. Um, and um, it, it's tragic. He started acknowledging it. He started asking journalists, do you think, people say I have brain damage, do you think there's something wrong with me? And he knew about it, and he kept fighting for at least another five or six years after he began to became aware of it. And his parents were urging him to stop. Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, was urging him to stop, and he just wouldn't stop. He loved the money, and he loved the attention, and uh, kept yet, going. Yet, um, when, when people talk about Muhammad Ali, and, and he suffered from Parkinson's disease, uh, late in his life, a lot of, a lot of uh, um, medical professionals would tell you that the, you know, those, those repeated concussions and, and, and that, that beating that he took regularly really is not related to Parkinson's. Well, I hate to contradict some of the, you know, Ali raised a lot of money and a lot of awareness for Parkinson's disease, but I think a strong case can be made that he only really had Parkinson's syndrome which is the diagnosis his doctors gave him when they, when they detected this for the first time mm -hmm. in the early 80s. They said it was definitely caused by the punches. They said it's Parkinson's syndrome, which is a set of symptoms that is uh, similar to Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. but it may not be the same. It may not be genetic at all. It may have been caused entirely by the punches. Mm -hmm. Without an autopsy, we'll never know, and there was no autopsy when Ali passed away, um, because I think the family probably prefers to think that this was not something he did to himself. Mm -hmm. But I think the evidence is pretty clear that boxing had something to do with it. And his doctors who diagnosed him in the first place said that this was caused by boxing. Wow. Well, that settles that, I suppose. Well, an autopsy would have settled it, but um, <laughs> yeah. we don't have that, unfortunately. Um, I, I look at Nixon. I mean, ooh, Nixon. <laughs> Liston, Nixon. Freudian <laughs> slip. Um, Sonny Liston. The and, big um, ugly bear, as Ali called him. And, and, and I see that he... Um, uh, He's a fearsome uh, fighter, no doubt. And, but as, at this time, uh, Cassius Clay was, was flirting with joining the Nation of Islam, or had he become a member of the Nation of Islam before this fight? Before the fight, he was denying it. 
in part because the boxing promoters were worried mm -hmm. that if he came out as a member of the Nation of Islam, it would destroy ticket sales. Mm -hmm. It was very hard for people to decide who they hated more at this point, Sonny Liston <laughs> or Cassius Clay, because Cassius Clay was, this guy, Sonny Liston was a thug who beat up police officers, and Cassius Clay was a loudmouth, poor sport, trash-talking, sassy, uppity, black kid who didn't know his place, and he was hanging out with Malcolm X, which scared the bejesus out of people. So people, I think, wanted both of these men to die in the ring. I think they wanted them to kill each other. Um, and then when, when Ali wins the fight, and the next day at the press conference, it confirms that he is a member of the Nation of Islam, and that he, uh, that's Elijah Muhammad in the middle, and Ali's brother, uh, Rudy, um, on, the, uh, on the other side. Um, he says, he makes, I think, maybe the most, one of the most important speeches of his life at a press conference, and he says, I was raised a Christian, but that was a religion that was given to me by slave owners. I didn't choose it. My name is basically a cattle brand that was put on me by the slave owners. Clay was the owner of my family. It's not the name I chose. And now I'm free. I'm free to be who I want. I'm free to do what I want. I'm free to say what I want. And nobody can tell me anymore what to do. Some of that power comes from being the heavyweight champion of the world, but I would argue that more of it, most of it, comes from the man that's sitting in the middle there, mm -hmm. Elijah Muhammad, who, who gave Ali those ideas. He gave Ali those ideas um, through Malcolm at first. Yes. And then Malcolm became persona non grata in the Nation of Islam. How did Ali deal with that split? So there are many moments in this book where I get angry at Ali, um, and that was one of them, when he turned his back on Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm left the Nation of Islam, decided to go his own way, start his own organization that would be more, that would embrace more of traditional Islam mm -hmm. and would also get involved in things like, in political issues, which Elijah Muhammad did not want to get involved in. Mm -hmm. And he asked Ali to come with him. And Ali said no, he would stick with Elijah Muhammad. And then when um, there were attempts on Malcolm's life, Malcolm and his wife appealed to Ali and said, at least do something, stand up for us, try to, you know, call off the assassins, whoever they are. And Ali turned his back on him. He literally, like, raised his hand and turned away, turned his back, and said, not my problem. In fact, he actually said that he thought Malcolm deserved to die for crossing Elijah Muhammad. And uh, he regretted that later in life, but uh, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, he had a chance to stand up for a friend and a, and a mentor, and he didn't do it. And there are those who say that Elijah Muhammad um, basically took advantage of Ali's celebrity to boost the nation's image in, 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 in uh, the black community and, and in America itself. What, do you think there was anything to that? And there's no question that having the heavyweight champ out there um, talking about you and, 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 and saying how wonderful your organization is um, was huge. It, it, it absolutely helped uh, boost enrollment. Uh, membership for the Nation of Islam, sold more newspapers, um, no question about it. And um, if you think about it, and, and um, it was Dick Gregory who made this point to me, um, at the time in the 60s, for any African American leader to be in the media, to be quoted, to be heard, they had to go through a white editor. So Martin Luther King's name is going to appear in the New York Times, well the New York Times white editors are going to decide which quotes to use in that story. And which, if, if um, Malcolm X or Elijah Muhammad's going to appear on TV. It's some white editor at CBS who's going to decide which quote to use, which portion. But Muhammad Ali could stand up in the boxing ring after a fight that was being watched by millions of people around the country and maybe, you know, m many millions more around the world. And there was a microphone in his face and he could say whatever he wanted for as long as he wanted and nobody could edit it. And I think that's an unbelievably powerful position to have, especially for a guy who's, you know, 22 years old. And, and every, after every fight, he thanked Allah and he thanked Elijah Muhammad, and um, that's some pretty powerful marketing. Very powerful marketing, and, and also uh, pretty contradictory for the Nation of Islam because the Nation of Islam was anti what they call sport and play, and would often criticize athletes for um, engaging in, in what Elijah Muhammad would consider frivolous activity, and yet, Muhammad Ali, not only was he celebrated for it in the nation, but he was given a, an honorary name, uh, honorific. And, and for, for, for people in the Nation of Islam, that was high praise indeed. And there was a lot of jealousy in the Nation of Islam uh, 
uh, for Muhammad Ali. Did you encounter any of that? Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, his, originally he said he was going to take the name Cassius X, mm -hmm. and then Elijah Muhammad phoned him and said, no, I'm giving you a special name. Mm -hmm. um, it's really only reserved for the highest ranking members. Um, giving you a whole new name, Muhammad Ali. And um, it created a lot of jealousy, as you said, within the organization. And um, when Ali continued to box, Elijah Muhammad was kind of conflicted. It was good for the nation of him, but it was also went directly against his own teachings mm -hmm. that, that, that sport was frivolous. And um, eventually, when, when Elijah, Muhammad in, uh, Elijah Muhammad encouraged Ali not to go back to boxing after he was banned. He was banned from boxing for three and a half years because he refused to accept the, his draft in the uh, Vietnam War. And he had his boxing license taken away from him. And when he decided to go back to boxing, Elijah Muhammad suspended him from the Nation of Islam. And, and he remained suspended for many years. But, uh, and, he, and in fact, Elijah Muhammad said he was taking away the name, Muhammad Ali. But Ali just decided to keep, you know, just to pretty much ignore that. <laughs> and um, Louis Farrakhan told me that he met with Elijah Muhammad after Ali decided to suspend Ali. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, and Elijah Muhammad told him, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you and all the others who had to give up something to become a member of the Nation of Islam. Louis Farrakhan had to give up a music career, mm -hmm. a very promising one, because music was considered frivolous too. Mm -hmm. So the way Farrakhan explained it was that Elijah Muhammad was trying to send a message to all these others who felt like it was hypocritical that Ali should be allowed to continue boxing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be because um, that, that kind of uh, celebrity is, is what is most, you know, that's a common way for a lot of African Americans to to gain the, the, the kind of uh, popularity and visibility that, that um, others couldn't, couldn't get. And so uh, Elijah Muhammad um, was, you know, he, he, he nurtured Ali um, in, in a way that he didn't, he didn't nurture other, uh, um, uh, other folks who wanted to become members of the group. And, and he, and, uh, there was a lot of questions about why, why that was the case, and especially when, when uh, the the division between Malcolm and Elijah became so so uh, uh, highly uh, contentious, um, and Muhammad Ali stayed with Elijah Muhammad, although he was criticizing him in many ways for being, for being a boxer. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think Ali and a lot of others, and maybe all of us, uh, to some extent, failed to live up to the teachings of his religion. Um, and, um, you know, Elijah Muhammad himself was making a compromise to allow Ali to keep boxing. But after the um, Foreman fight in 74, uh, when Ali finally won back the heavyweight championships, he had the heavyweight championship stripped from him um, in 1967. He was allowed to continue boxing again in 71 and came back and um, got knocked down and lost to Joe Frazier. And this is, in some ways, I think, the key moment in Ali's career in that he gets knocked down and he gets back up and he finishes the fight and he loses. And people begin to see him as a tough guy, uh, someone who suffered, who's a martyr. He, you know, he, he, he sacrificed for his beliefs. Um, you may not have agreed with his stance. You may not have agreed with his religion. But you got to admit that he paid the price. And this is the moment, really, when you start to see Ali becoming popular in American society. It's when he gets knocked down, which is a whole other story. Why is it that we only like our black heroes when they're, when they're knocked down, when they're weak, when they can't talk anymore? Ali becomes more and more beloved the less he speaks out. That's a, you know, we can talk all day about that. It's, it's, it's troubling in many ways, and it's still troubling today when you look at the fact that we don't want to hear our black athletes speaking out. Colin Kaepernick is expected, expected to do his job as a quarterback but not express any opinions of his own. Um, but that's when Ali starts to become popular. Um. Yes, and, and uh, he becomes popular both with, uh, within the black community and on the outside of the black community. He starts to attract supporters from the anti-war movement um, because of his stance against Vietnam, although at the same time, as you point out, he was, he was referring to, to white people as devils. Yeah. And, and uh, yet that was, that was forgiven for, for his, uh, his stance against the Vietnam War. Yeah, Ali was always so complicated on race. Um, you know, he, he would say that black people, white people are all devils, but there he is clowning around with Howard Cosell and Johnny Carson on TV and seems to be having a good time. And he um, would always, he would call Joe Frazier and Uncle Tom 
He would demean other black people who should have been seen as black heroes in, their, in, in our society. And at the same time, he showed a lot more respect for his white opponents in the ring. It was, you know, Ali was a tough guy to figure out sometimes in that way. And, and he seemed to like, like I said earlier, he had these warring impulses. He wanted to be popular and he wanted to be the rebel. By the 70s, I think he mostly wanted to be popular. And it's a different era. You know, the civil rights movement isn't on the streets anymore. We're not marching. Um, King is dead. Um, the Jeffersons are on TV. <laughs> Where you know, integration is, is, a, is a source, is, is something for a sitcom now. And Ali, he kind of seems happy about that in a way. He seems to be content to be a boxer and an entertainer and not to have to be so controversial anymore. And then, of course, while uh, Elijah Muhammad dies in 75, and his son, Wallace Muhammad, takes over and changes the the uh, orientation of the Nation of Islam, makes, uh, brings it more in accord with Orthodox Islam, drops the racial restrictions and, and the dress codes and all of that, and kind of opens it up. And this releases Ali, really, to become much more involved with, uh, with, with society as, as he, you know, as his celebrity indicates he should be, right? That's right, and he does begin to study Orthodox Islam and, and embraces it, and it becomes a very important part of his life. So that's not to say that he was just waiting for the chance to become you know, an upper class wealthy you know, American and forget all about his religion. But he does seem to be relieved that, that the death of Elijah Muhammad allows him to learn more about Orthodox Islam and to stop uh, being associated with this very controversial organization. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, and, and he seems to, to uh, um, Wallace Muhammad, how does Wallace Muhammad relate to him? I think Ali immediately accepts Wallace Muhammad as, 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 the, as the successor to Elijah Muhammad. And they, have a, they seem to have a very strong relationship. And, and Wallace Muhammad continues to urge Ali to stop boxing. They travel to Europe together, and Ali announces, this is in 76 or 77, I think, mm -hmm. that he's done. He's officially retired. Um, that he, 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 you know, he realizes that his place is in the nation of Islam, that he's going to spend the rest of his life as a minister. But then he gets back home and there's offers to fight on the table and they're, they're gonna pay me $3 million to fight Joe Bugner. I mm. wouldn't even hire that guy to be my sparring partner. Uh, <laughs> so he's, you know, he's, he's still very much uh, of this world and is not prepared to, to move on to the, uh, to the realm of, of religion is a, in a, in a full-time way. And I think it's, again, because what could be as satisfying as being the heavyweight champ and being surrounded by this entourage and all these people who love you all the time and you know, becoming a minister is not quite as sexy. No offense. <laughs> well, was he, ever, was he ever really a minister? Uh, no. In, in fact, that's interesting because he filed uh, all kinds of affidavits during the, the, when his case was in court. You know, he, was, he was convicted of draft evasion, sentenced to five years in prison. And while the case was being appealed, he got letters from hundreds and hundreds of members of the Nation of Islam saying that he's a minister. And meanwhile, the FBI tapes that I found, um, I got all of FBI, Ali's FBI files, said that he and Elijah Muhammad were on the phone and, Mah and Elijah Muhammad was reminding them that he's not a minister. Um, <laughs> but Elijah Muhammad's lawyers and Ali's lawyers were nevertheless um, trying to use that in, as a claim to keep him out of jail, and, which worked. But um, no, he was never a minister. And, um, but he, but he, but he took his, his faith seriously, and he really, especially after he after he embraced Orthodox Islam, he did become a student of the Quran and, mm -hmm. and of, of Orthodox Islam. You know, um, one of the things you point out, and, and you, you mentioned this earlier, how it relates to today's struggle in, in, with with black athletes, Colin Kaepernick, for example. There's a, there's an iconic photograph of, of Muhammad Ali with other with other athletes, Jim Brown, Lou Alcinda, who was now. Um, um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and, and a few others who, who, who were there. And, it, it, and it's often pointed to that meeting as when black athletes were deeply involved in politics, and that they, you know, uh, John Carlos and, and the Olympics when they raised their fists and all of that. Um, and actually, the reason for that meeting was something quite different. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, this is seen as one of the epic moments in the history of African-American athletes as, as warriors, as social warriors, cultural warriors. And it's called the Cleveland Summit. And it was it, uh, Jim Brown supposedly put this meeting together to show support for Ali. Ali said he wasn't going to fight, and he was being labeled a traitor for this. And the story goes that all these black athletes came together to say, we stand by Ali. Except that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> Turns out it was a white guy, a Jewish white guy, who had the idea for the meeting, Bob Arum. And he was losing millions of dollars because Ali wasn't fighting. 
So he decided to offer some of these black athletes a cut of the action if they could get Ali to go back to fighting. And, he, and Aram's lawyer contacted an official in the Johnson administration who agreed that if Ali would box some exhibitions for the troops, they would let him out of service. He would just be like Joe Lewis, he would do the, 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 the tour, and that he could go back to his boxing career you know, quickly, if not immediately. So they had cut a deal, and Bob Aram needed to convince Ali to take the deal. So he gets Jim Brown, Lou Alcindor, all these dozen other athletes to meet Ali in Cleveland with, with the purpose of convincing Ali to, to do this deal and get back into the ring as fast as possible. And each one of these athletes will be given a, a piece of the, of the company that owns the TV rights to Ali's fights. Mm. <laughs> History is much more interesting when, when you embrace the nuance and when you don't accept the, uh, the mythology. And what happened was Ali walked into the room and said, you guys are wasting your time. And he was always a fun guy to be around. They yucked it up for a couple of hours. They, and, and, and some of the members in the room were, were former military. And they said, you know, you're doing a disservice to your country. They spoke their minds. But when they saw that Ali was definitely not going to be persuaded, they said, okay, well, if you're not going to change your mind, we, we stand behind you. We'll, and that, we'll have a press conference and we'll say, He's serious about this. He's really, um, you know, he's sincere in his beliefs. And if his religion says that he shouldn't, that he, has, that he can't fight, then that's his choice. So they had this press conference. And they announced their support for him, and that became the, the that's where the myth began to grow. Yeah, the myth grew indeed. It did, as it grow. so often does. Yes, indeed. There are those who say that Ali really didn't become popular in white, white America until he couldn't speak, until Parkinson's um, ravaged him. Um, how do you, how do you uh, respond to that? Well, st uh, it's true in a way. Stanley Crouch has this great line. He says that Ali in the 60s was a grizzly bear. He was wild. He was dangerous. You didn't go near him with it unless you were ready to, you know, you could get killed. In the 70s, he becomes more like a circus bear. He's still dangerous, but he's entertaining and we'll pay to watch him from a distance. And then in the, in the last act of his career in the 90s, 80s and 90s, he's like a teddy bear and we just want to hug him. And I think it's really true, but I think it's unfortunate because it says that we're only comfortable with our heroes when they're safe, that we're not comfortable with Malcolm X until he accepts the fact that white people are okay and that uh, you know, nonviolence is, is the way he wants to go. Well, you know, that just tells us about, about who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Ali, of course, really, um, what people forget is that during the 80s and early 90s, he was forgotten. He could, you could hire him for $3,000 to sit all day at your used car lot and sign autographs. And he was depressed. He missed being the center of attention, but he was, he, he had a hard time speaking. Um, his voice was a, a mere whisper. He sometimes fell asleep in, during interviews and he shuffled when he walked. And it really wasn't until that was this moment that we embrace him as a society and that we s sort of forgive him all of his sins, and it's because he's shaking. I don't think there's any doubt about it. If he'd still been loud and radical and in our faces, it would not have been the same reaction. And you watch that. Go home tonight and watch the YouTube video. When Ali steps out, nobody knows who's going to light the torch. It's 1996 Atlanta, and suddenly he emerges from the shadows with that torch, and his hand is shaking. The crowd doesn't roar. It doesn't applaud. It gasps. It's like this moment of, a, of, a, of awakening. Oh my God, it's Ali, we missed him. We forgive, we forgive him for mm -hmm. all of the things he did before. And, and, and they really, like Stanley Crouch said, we just wanna hug him. And that changes everything for the rest of his life. Hmm. Um, yeah, this was in Atlanta. I, I think about the, the other time he was in Atlanta uh, where there was a lot of press interested is when he first came back right. to the ring in Fort Jer Jerry Quarry. Uh, and and it, it was, in, in the black community, it was noteworthy. I mean, it was in, in Ebony and in Jet, there were these large photographs of every conceivable uh, uh, player and pimp and, and <laughs> underground character was in Atlanta that day yeah. to see the Muhammad Ali uh, fight. And, and uh, what, what was, why was he so attractive to this element? It was almost as if, I think of it almost as like a celebration of the, the end of the 60s. Um, the, the, the struggle on the streets are over and we can celebrate. Ali survived the 60s. He's allowed to box again. 
we've come through this. Atlanta is a city that claims that they don't have the kind of hate that these other southern mm-hmm. cities had. Mm-hmm. And this is the perfect place. And, and, and black and, and white society, they just want to come out and celebrate this moment. It's as if, um, you know, America's trying to heal their wounds of the civil, of the civil rights battles. And here's this heavyweight championship fight. Ali's allowed to fight again. We've gotten over some of the agony of the civil of the of Vietnam. We're getting over some of the agony of the deaths of King and Kennedy, and we can just enjoy a sporting spectacle again. And it's a black man and a white man, white man in the ring fighting, and that's okay too. It's not even about race. It's about it, it, people just want to party. I think, um, and 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 that, that's what that's what it is. And then that's you see the 70s. It's it's a different era, man. It's a, you know, it's it's the age of ego. It's the age of uh, disco, and and um, it, it all begins to change. And that's really a, 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 a signal moment, I think. Hmm. Yeah, there's so much, really, so much to to talk about with this with this uh, very interesting book, uh, Jonathan. You should be very proud Thank of your you. accomplishments, man. Um, we, we didn't even get into Zaire, which was a <laughs> real big issue. Can I there. tell you one good Zaire story mm-hmm. before we have time? Before we get, I want to show you. So George Foreman is seen as the biggest and toughest guy in the world. He's like Sonny Liston all over again. He's younger than Ali. He's stronger than Ali. Ali is um, 32 at this point, and everybody assumes that he's got no chance. And they're on the plane over to Zaire, and, I, and, and, uh, and Ali's manager says to him, you know, you can't do your usual thing here. You can't call George Foreman and Uncle Tom. They're not going to know what that is in Zaire. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Ali says, well, who do they hate? <laughs> and his, his manager says, well, they really hate the Belgians. The Belgians, you know. <laughs> so Ali gets off the plane, and he's standing on the tarmac. There's thousands of Zairians spread out across him. He raises his arms in the air. He says, I am the greatest of all times. And George Foreman is a Belgian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and George gets off the plane the next day, and he doesn't know what hit him. He's, Why do they hate me here? He can't understand it, and he is miserable the entire time he's in, he's in Zaire. But, but he also brings his German shepherd He brings a with German him. shepherd with him, which is like the kind of police dog the, 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 the Belgians used to use. It's just, <laughs> just bad luck for George. And George tells me that, that he was drugged by his own manager before the fight. I said, you really believe that your own manager drugged you? He said, I don't believe it, I know it. And then he says, here's another thing. Um, before the fight, my manager came to me and said, we need to give the referee $25,000 cash to make sure it's a fair fight. So I gave the ref $25,000, and I found out later that Ali's team gave him more than $25,000. <laughs> so I called Ali's manager, Gene Kilroy, I said, George says that they gave the ref $25,000 and that you guys gave him even more. And his manager, Gene Kilroy, says, that's ridiculous. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. We only gave him $10,000. <laughs> Uh, man, the, the, the stories are endless. They really are. Yeah, I could go on. Um, yeah, and be, because I, like I said, I spent, I, I met Muhammad Ali in, in Jamaica in 74. Um, he had, he had just won in, in Zaire. Well, not just, about two months ago. And, uh, he was the, the he was the toast of the town in Jamaica. Yeah. Um, but, and I went by a hotel to interview him and, uh, you know, he, I suspected he would be a pious Muslim, uh, <laughs> someone who was, you know, who was observing the laws of Islam and all of that. And I saw about four, may, maybe more than that, but at least, at least four young, young ladies wandering around his hotel room. Um, That'd be an off night for Ali. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's, another, that's another feature of your book that I found extremely uh, enlightening is, is Ali's... <laughs> Ali's philandering, his, his, well, his audacious philandering. Well, thanks for not making that the whole focus of, the, <laughs> of our conversation. Um, but it was also disappointing, and I know um, I spent a lot of time with his wives talking about that, and it was painful for me to see the, the pain he caused them. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, that was part of his love for attention. You know, his wife, his Khalila, said to me that he didn't, she didn't even think he really liked sex that much. He just liked the people. He liked pleasing people and making them... My happy, and he would just felt like he was giving something of himself, and it's that's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> complicated. Let's not let's not let's not, uh, let's not go too far there. <laughs> did, 
Did you find people reluctant to, to get into this uh, in, in your interviews? I mean, uh, were people, I mean, a lot of times folks want to, you know, relieve themselves of all of their, their burdens. And yeah, I think for Kalila, after a while, when she began to trust me, she really wanted to, people to see how much she suffered with mm -hmm. this. And, and you know, she said, I was young, I felt like he needed me. And I think this is something you hear often from, from women in a, in a, in a bad, ma in a marriage that's got these problems, um, that she felt like she was the one holding it together. That without her around, she wouldn't, he wouldn't be the champ. He wouldn't be able to keep it all going. So from there, she ends up like booking hotel rooms for his mistresses and sharing women, saying, okay, for the next two nights, I'm going to go sleep in the other room so that you can be with your mistresses. So mm. now she says, I was used. I was abused. It was, you know, but at the time, it was something that she felt like she had to do or that was, it seemed normal to her. And that's, so yeah, getting, talking to that, these, about that was was hard, but you know, one of the important things I try to do in this book is not just to paint him as a saint. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't do our, ourselves any favors by turning our heroes into saints. That's we right. need to understand that they were real people with flaws, and I think that, you know, it, 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 a big part of my responsibility, I felt like, with this book was to be honest. Were you astounded by anything you uncovered? <laughs> so many things. Um, <laughs> I'll end on a nice note uh, when it comes to uh, the astonishing things. He somehow remained humble. And, and you know, I know he went around saying, I'm the prettiest, I'm the greatest, and all that. But if you met the man on the street, he wanted to be your friend, and he never thought he was better than you. And he, he truly had this humility that is, is almost impossible to understand. But, uh, and his manager in the 90s, when he was out in the wilderness before the torch, told me that, um, one day, um, an old man from Africa knocked on the door of Ali's house, and he's, carrying, he's got his grandson by his side and a McDonald's bag in his hand, and he said, is this Muhammad Ali's house? And the manager says, yes, it is. And what, can I help you? And he says, well, we've come from Africa. I, wanted to, I want my grandson to meet Ali. And the manager goes in the house and tells Ali, and Ali comes out, and the man hands him the McDonald's bag and says, we brought this for you. It's like an offering, you know, when you visit someone's home. And Ali invites them in. He eats the hamburger and spends all day with them, and then drives them back to their hotel. And they're staying at a little motel by the airport in LA. And the manager's riding along with him at the end of the day, says, why? Why didn't you just sign the autograph and be gone? And he said, well, you know, I did a lot of bad things in my life. And I think that there's an angel up there keeping track of all the bad things I did and all the good things mm. I did. Tallying angel, he called it. And he's tallying up my good deeds, and I got to do a lot more good deeds, <laughs> or I'm going to hell. Mm. And I think he thought about that, you know, every day, um, especially given that he felt like he'd racked up a fair number of bad deeds, too. So he didn't have to do that. He was, I think he felt like these people are as important as I am. And I think he, he really, when he met people, he felt that way about them. So that was astonishing to me. Okay. You were, you were, Al, you were an Ali fan before you did the book. Are you an Ali fan now? Yeah, but, you know, growing up, it makes life complicated, right? You get to be an adult and you realize your parents' marriage was probably a lot more complicated than it seemed when you were a kid, right? Same thing with your heroes. You grow up and you realize your heroes are, are not saints. And uh, I had this poster on my ceiling in my room when I was you know, 11 years old. It was like the first thing I looked at every day and the <laughs> last thing I looked at at night. And he was something more than just a sports hero to me. Hmm. Um, because he was, first of all, he was an individual. He wasn't just wearing it on a team. And he was, he was this star of a different magnitude. He was funny. He was beautiful, he was controversial, he was talking politics that I didn't really understand, but I knew that he was doing things that other athletes weren't doing. And I emerged from writing this book still feeling like he's a hero to me, even though he profoundly disappointed me at times. I still, you can probably hear it in my, and see it in my eyes, that I still light up when I think of the guy. And, uh, and so do his wives, by the way. They're, they're all wow. still in love with him. Wow. Wow. That's great praise indeed. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, thank you. Bye.